Hello, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, we're excited today to be here and talk about how to scale rugged DevOps, really thousands of applications. And I'm really excited um, to be up on stage with two kind of four leading experts in this space. Uh, quickly, my name is Sarag Patel. I'm with a company called Contrast Security. Um, and I'm chief strategy officer there. And I think what I'll start off with, uh, gentlemen, is um, maybe a quick intro as well as um, uh, if you can explain to us kind of what is the application security challenge that you guys see in your organizations? Sure. Um, Aaron Reinhardt, I'm the Chief Enterprise Security Architect for United Health Group in Optum. Um, I have a diverse background from defense to aerospace uh, to uh, education uh, before I came uh, to United Health Group. Um, uh, our specific challenge is one really, it's a story of complexity. Uh, our business in general is roughly, our portfolio is roughly about 360 companies. Um, we're, we're way beyond healthcare and insurance. Um, and uh, we have a uh, application portfolio of, of larger than about 16,000 applications, uh, about anywhere from 25 to 27,000 uh, developers. We have FISMA, we have uh, HIPAA, we've got high trust. Every framework and regulation you can think of, pretty much we have to deal with it. Uh, you know, a lot of folks thought that uh, DevOps wouldn't be possible and DevOps security would be a challenge. It has been, but uh, we, we've, we've been able to make it happen so far. Okay. So pretty straightforward, it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Tim Chase. I work at Nielsen, uh, the, the ratings group. Um, and I think that we probably have some of the same challenges that Aaron does, but um, ours is really two-factor, really. We have different areas uh, of, of the business that operate quite differently. So a lot of people are familiar with the watch side of Nielsen, which is the ratings and um, who watches what and how they watch TV. But we also have the buy side of the business, which is who, um, what do they consume, what are the purchasing habits. And each side of the business kind of runs a little bit differently. So you've got the businesses that run differently, um, their development groups run differently, and then you have different flavors of Agile and, and DevOps kind of across the different groups. So our challenges are finding ways to embed security um, into the different um, technology offices, into the different DevOps groups um, in a kind of a, a consistent manner. Okay, so let's, let's start at the very top. Obviously, to be able to secure your, your portfolios, um, the first thing you gotta know is what you're securing and, and what the scope of that is, right? So how do you guys do that today? Not just to understand the software that's out there and the application out there, but also the libraries you're using and other components that are part of these pieces. And, and secondarily, how do you keep that up to date? You want to take it first? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I think that that's an interesting um, challenge I think that we're facing right now in, um, is how do you actually get an idea of who's developing what, where are they developing it, and I think that's um, what we're really working through. But kind of what we're looking at doing um, um, in a DevOps and Agile way is, is using a tool like um, AgileCraft where we have the ability to track um, all of the different projects that we have going on across Nielsen. Um, it's, it's where we're going so that you can kind of, um, every program is, is required to use that and you can go in there and you can um, have checkpoints set up so to make sure that um, when you uh, start a project and you need to get a dashboard of, of if you've had your security testing done or if you've had your architectural review, you can see all of that in one place. And so that's um, really where we kind of get an, an idea of, of what we need to test. Um, and then also, um, we're, we have some uh, some scripts set up because you can't always trust uh, that people will do the, the right thing. So we have some scripts run up that routinely um, every week kind of goes out and searches um, uh, the internet um, using things like um, Recon NG and Looking Glass and things like that to understand what is Nielsen exposing to the outside world. Do we know about it? Have we tested it? Just kind of have that additional uh, checkpoint. Um, so that's kind of what we, what we do there from an application security point. Um, our story is very similar. I mean, we uh, are trying. Uh, we, have, we don't have everything figured out. Right? Um, there are a lot of challenges still in front of us. Uh, but our focus is to try to build the instrumentation, metrics, and measurement uh, into the pipeline as much as possible. Uh, and try to, uh, it's funny, I heard uh, Shannon from Intuit talk about it's a, how it's a big data pro uh, problem. Uh, I really feel that uh, uh, managing the data and the output from the tools, uh, not the tools themselves, is the future of uh, man the managing of the DevOps security program. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense, right? If you if you know what you're protecting, it makes your job a lot easier. Um, the second question is, is and, and, you know, big theme obviously for today is 
Um, the sooner you can identify vulnerabilities and remediate them and, and fix them uh, makes uh, the cost of that vulnerability much lower, right? And the risk obviously much lower. Um, so what have you done to shorten that feedback loop from when vulnerabilities and software risks are introduced to when they're um, fixed? And then secondarily is, you know, as part of that, what are your development team counterparts, what do they expect of you as, as security leaders? Um, I think that what we're seeing is that a lot of our developers are actually coming to us quicker than they used to. It used to be um, more of a checkpoint or a checkbox back when we were doing more of a waterfall method, but we're seeing developers come to us and say, you know, what can we do because we don't, we don't want to wait, you know, in, until we're about ready to release it to production or it's already been released in production before we test. So what we do is we provide them um, as many tools as we can. I think the, the, I've heard the term a couple times today is shift everything left, which is kind of our goal. So we provide um, developers tools to use like Sonar Cube and, um, and find bugs and things like that that they can integrate into their IDE. So our goal is to, is to put as many tools um, in front of the developers as we can that work in their environment. We don't force them to go to um, uh, our tool to look at the security results. We don't force them to look through a PDF that uh, we just send over to them. We put the, the information in front of them. And so using, you know, contrast and zap, you, you've got all of, these, all of these things that you can give them um, and, and uh, kind of get that information to them sooner so that before it gets to your, your testing phase or your UAT that they've already looked at it, they see the results and it's been in front of them in JIRA or in uh, Eclipse or what have you. You know, it's about, you know, I mean, our story is very similar. And it's, it, we find it's, it's a lot about two groups of folks that, you know, uh, really did speak a different language and never truly, um, you know, uh, understood the world in which each other lived in. Uh, and we're finding that uh, our, our, the expectation for development teams and DevOps teams is, is uh, that we use their tools, that we put things in their terms that we um, provide feedback in a manner which is consumable by them uh, and is effective for them. Um, okay, great, so it sounds like uh, it's about like making things continuous, making, uh, working in the way that development teams want to work and giving them the information they need when they need it kind of thing. Great, um, so the, the, you know, th that kind of leads me into my next question, which is, um, you know, if, if security, either processes, tools, whatever it may be, adds friction to the release process from development, um, development uh, is, is great and quick at finding ways to work around it. Um, how, what are you doing to make sure that what you introduce um, is built in a way that it makes it friction free? Um, so we, we try to build it in as much as possible into the process, into the pipeline. Uh, we try to, um, uh, we, we, are, we work directly with um, DevOps teams when we, we're building the capabilities to ensure uh, it meets uh, the criteria and the standards in which they operate. Um, it's very much a partnership. Yeah. yeah, and I think in addition, kind of what we do a lot of times is we try and build um, security champions on the development team. So um, it's, it's impossible for my security team to be able to be on every single um, development process and project. So uh, what we try and do is come up with security champions who can represent us at um, on the agile uh, meetings, you know, where they prioritize uh, what's going to go into the next sprint. So um, that doesn't mean that they're the security experts, but it means that they know what to look for. They can work with the business um, and the product leaders when they go to um, prioritize. Um, so that's kind of a, a key for us as well. Yeah, and it sounds pretty consistent with what we hear, right? It's about um, finding ways to integrate things, getting, the, getting it back to the teams and the tools they're used to using and the tools that they have to use every single day without adding additional complexity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we, a big part of being able to scale rugged DevOps is about um, uh, leveraging processes and tools and different things that enable that um, automation, that security. Now, how do, you, how do you deal with that? How do you, picking tools and, and, cap and capabilities that are scalable, like what, what do you, that don't require a lot of experts, that don't require a lot of time, how do you, how do you pick those tools? Oh, this, this, is a, this is definitely a problem for us at United uh, due to our complexity of the, comp of the company, the regulatory um, landscape. Um, but we always, at any point in time, we drive out complexity and drive in simplicity. And that's not an easy task. That's a difficult thing to do. Um, where possible, we try to build standards across uh, the execution. Uh, we look for um, ways to um, really just ways to simplify and become standard in the way we operate, because complex things don't scale. So. 
And I think kind of in addition to that, we look for tools that um, are easy for developers to use. You know, it's not that easy to have a static tool that just sits on their desktop, right? And they have to make sure that they run it. That's not very helpful to, to a developer or to the DevOps teams. But if you give them something where you can call an API um, and they can kick off a scan, or if you give them something that you can run inside of a Jenkins build, um, that makes it easy for them. So for us, when we, one of the things that we look at, you know, beyond the standards and things like that is, is what can a developer team run that easily fits into their existing process um, that meets our uh, security needs and our standards. And that's, and that's a good point. And we find that uh, one way to, to really drive um, speed and scale is to put the, the tools in the develop, development team's hands, yeah. right? And security folks can focus on the output of the tools. That's, that's what's important, right? That's what we get paid to be security professionals for, is to be good at, the, at understanding those outputs and how to fix it. Yeah, and so the goal is arming them with the tools they need in a way that they're able to use it um, without much friction and, and then leveraging kind of security expertise to kind of monitor and support that whole process. It becomes mm -hmm. a, a yeah. shared responsibility. Okay, great. Um, obviously, one of the, the, the biggest risks um, that we all deal with is false negatives, right? If you miss something, if you're not thinking about a specific type of vulnerability or a specific category of things, um, what, what do you guys do to make sure you have your full checklist and you're checking all the boxes? Are you using frameworks? Or are you using tools? What are you doing to make sure you're not missing out on, on types of on vulnerabilities? I think that one of the things that you do is, is you don't have a, you make sure that you have multiple tools in your tool set. If you, if you fully rely on one tool um, and that's it, then there's a possibility you're putting kind of all your eggs in one basket. So have multiple tools, um, not too many that it becomes overwhelming. It's a balancing act, but it's okay if they overlap a little bit. Um, some of your static and dynamic tools, they may overlap and, and that's okay because some are better at testing some things um, than others. And also I think that you just need to, have a, some sort of a framework uh, that you develop. So if you think um, OWASP, everybody knows the OWASP top 10, right? And so you make sure that if you're doing your static um, tools or your um, IaaS tools or your dynamic tools, that, you know, that those really cover everything that's in the OWASP top 10. In addition to that, you can look at some of the other frameworks that are out there, whether it's NIST or, um, uh, you know, I look at the, the CIS framework that they put out uh, with the top 20 controls. So as you start to get more into the ops part of DevOps, um, you, that's where that really comes into to play to make sure you have all of your um, networking security um, scripted out uh, when you do a release. So, uh, I mean, we really like the approach of um, moving forward. It's still a challenge. We haven't figured it out, but we're looking forward to what's the vision, right? All these tools keep coming in, right? Um, it feels like there's a new open source tool, tool on GitHub every day. Um, you know, what's the right tool? When, when do you use it? Um, and am I getting the quality of data output that I need, right, to drive in good security as a function of quality? And we, we believe that the, the path forward on that is less about the tool and more about the data that the tool provides, uh, aggregating that data, looking for that overlap, right? That overlap is important to, to validate, uh, you know, the existence of, of, of vulnerabilities, but also uh, th that driving the data towards a single big data type repository allows you to do uh, data science, data manipulation, uh, and truly understand your your uh, vulnerability and threat the portfolio sure. um, in a new way. So. Yeah, so it's that, it's like, you know, from based on what both you said is, there's various frameworks you use, there's internal expertise, obviously, and there's tools, and by having some overlap across that, you're able to get to um, all of the background you need. Um, so uh, the next question I had was kind of around you know, obviously about scalability, right? We, we're talking about scaling secure de uh, rugged DevOps to thousands or you know, hundreds or thousands of applications. The way, you know, one of the, one of the things that's often talked about and how you make that effective is you talk about turning, you know, for example, security into code, building reusable assets, whether that's code, whether that's processes or tools. Um, what have you guys done in terms of like, you know, driving standard defenses or standard techniques that team must, teams must use to build that security element in? Um, so we, uh, uh, we really do focus on breaking big problems down into smaller problems, problems and focusing on um, uh, identifying, building uh, um, reusable assets that can solve those issues, but, be, but um, build once, use many times uh, kind of scenario. And I think that one of the things that we try and do um, is, is uh, make sure that, that we use something like containers so that basically you can um, put all of your security testing uh, that you may want um, inside, of a, inside of a Docker container. Um, and so that all you have to do is um, 
copy it from basically one project to the next. Um, I think we probably got another question on that. But um, and so basically, you can uh, there's a tool called Glue out there that you can use, and, and you can um, integrate it with Jenkins, and you can take all of your security tests and script it out, um, and you can copy it from project to project to project, and you can um, turn things on and off based on uh, whether you um, whether you kind of the, basically the project needs. Um, so we we look to do that, and I think that's one of the keys that before you can build it out across thousands of applications, I think you have to uh, you can't custom tailor your security testing for every project. I and mean, if you think about it, um, 10 years ago and the way that we did it, you know, everybody had to send you the code and then uh, you would do threat modeling for every single application and it would be kind of a very manual process. But the, the real key to doing it for um, thousands of applications is, is being able to have something like a Docker container that you can basically give to a developer and say, here, um, here's my, uh, my, my contrast agent, my zap agent, my... Um, uh, my dependency checker, and you put it all in kind of in one place, give it to the development teams, and um, everything happens you know, on the back end. Things get pushed to JIRA, things come back from JIRA. Um, that's kind of where we go um, in our environment. And do you, do you guys like mandate that kind of practice across the organization, or is it an optional thing on a per development it, we're, team? We're pushing it out. It, it, it's not really optional. Um, you know, there's one thing that is consistent across our environment is that pretty much everybody uses um, some sort of a, a, I would say 95% of everybody uses Jenkins um, from a development team. So we say, you know, here's what you have to do um, for your project. You know, we mandate that you do security testing because it meets X, Y, and Z criteria, and here's how you're going to do it. Um, and, and we may have different, it's not like you have one container and everybody has to do it exactly the same way. Uh, you may, you know, you may have a technology that, uh, you know, for example, that maybe Fortify doesn't support or, um, you know, like, and so you have to substitute something else and that's okay, um, but the, you can have three or four different Docker containers that you give to the development teams based on the project need. But the key is that you just basically have something that you can give to them um, in a repeatable process. And, and how, do you, how do you guys handle that, Aaron, with 16,000 or 19,000 applications and numerous teams you guys are always folding in? Are you mandating security practices in terms of reusable assets, or is it? Um... So, I mean, we, we try not to you know, seem like we're mandating anything, but I mean, there are, we do have our internal company policies, depending on whether it's a commercial product or not an internal uh, capability. But yeah, we, we have a very similar approach to what Tim was talking about. I mean, we have some security tools like, like Gauntlet, uh, uh, where we've built um, uh, uh, tools like Arachne and SSLIs to do DAST or dynamic application security testing, um, in, uh, where you know we make it so it's easily callable via Jenkins and can run, or run, or can run and it's, right. it's very similar approach. Okay, great. Um, t Tim, one thing we were talking about earlier is uh, you mentioned. You know, for this notion of uh, rugged DevOps or DevSecOps to scale across your organization, your processes and your tool chains have to be portable and repeatable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, how have you achieved this? I know you talked about Docker containers earlier. Yeah, uh, what we've done, uh, just to kind of get a little bit more in depth into it, um, is we've used a tool called Glue. Um, it's an open source tool from uh, OWASP, uh, which, you know, there are a lot of great open source tools out there um, these days. It's one of the things that we're finding. And so with Glue, what you can do is you can um, basically take, uh, you can script out different um, security tools that you want to use. So if you're going to use uh, Burp, um, you could script that out to where you're, you know, you hand Burp all the parameters and it runs and um, you can feed, then you can feed it into Jira. Um, and we've kind of done that with, uh, with all of our different um, with, with all of our different applications. And so uh, you, in, with, uh, it hooks into Jenkins, which everybody uses, um, and we've basically just given that to the project teams, uh, provided that to them, hooked it up to um, JIRA, which is pretty much a corporate standard, um, and all of it happens um, automatically um, through that particular tool. Uh, Great. Um, uh, anything else to add to that, Aaron, on what you guys have done to help make this repeatable and portable? Um, I mean, it's similar to what we've already or what we've been discussing. I mean, we really focus on um, uh, looking for um, you know uh, standard ways to solve the problem many times yeah. uh, by building it once. Um, we uh, we do focus on building it in their tools. Right? We focus uh, you know on the developer point of view. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, Aaron, one of the things we we had talked about earlier is this notion of um, uh, just you know, as, as we talk about scale, right, I think there's, there's 
not that many companies out there deal with the type of scale you're, think, you're talking about here. But um, you talked about keeping things simple and having standard operating models. What, what, what does that mean? So by keeping things simple, so um, we, we try to, from a tool strategy to, to the tools we create to um, how we um, inter interact with DevOps teams and pipelines, um, so with tools, we try to we're tr we're trying to drive towards a tool independent strategy, to, and, and we feel that focusing on the data output is the path forward to that. Uh, you have to be able to create the. F my, uh, my old man once told me uh, he told me two things when it comes to building things: uh, measure three times, cut once, um, and always use the right tool for the job. And we want to we want to build a uh, a flexibility and capability to uh, to where that is possible. Um, Okay, great. Um, I've got several, I, I can talk all day, but I've got several more questions for you guys, but let me pause real quick and see if there's any questions in the audience um, for our panelists. I think there's mics in the middle. If anyone has a question, you're welcome to jump up. Um, looks like we've got a shy audience. Here's one. So let me repeat the question you guys can answer. So um, the question was, um, have, have we dealt with uh, different development teams that have different models and different uh, processes, and how do we bring that all together? Wow, what a, what a good question. <laughs> um, well, so at United Health Group, we have an appetite for acquiring things. Uh, we, buy, we buy anywhere from, I think over the past 10 years, anywhere from 10 to 20, 25-ish companies a year. But that brings its own challenges at their own frameworks, own um, we have we have scaled out to a framework. We we have uh, waterfall. We have uh, all all uh, different flavors of of, of safe right uh, or of scaled agile. Um, we have our own. Uh, we have many different uh, models to deal with. Um, and that is a challenge. Uh, what we try to drive towards a standard um, scaled agile framework that, that we've built. Yeah, I think that um, on our side, we're kind of a mixed bag with, we still have some hang, you know, some waterfall that's hanging about, but most of the stuff that we do is, is DevOps. But I think that the, the framework is the, the same from what we've done from, from our perspective. Um, it's that you, you build a container with all of your security tests kind of inside of it, and whether it's, um, whether it's waterfall or whether it's, um, whether it's agile or you know DevOps, whatever it happens to be, all of that stuff I think ends up kind of being the same. Uh, with with waterfall, your tests may not run as often, right? Because you, they may do a build every week, um, but with uh, continuous integration, they may do it every night, and your tests will run every night. So I think that from our perspective. Um, it's, it's pretty much the same. The only thing that maybe, maybe causes it to vary is the technology that you have. So, uh, for example, uh, on our side, uh, a standard Java app it, you know, may have one particular set of tests that we run against it. But uh, when we go to .NET, some of the stuff that we use for Java won't work against it. Same with SAP. Um, in, in addition, the thing that maybe will vary it a little bit more is the, the risk of the app. So uh, you may have an application that um, you know, that maybe is installed in somebody's home, like a meter or whatever it happens to be. Uh, that is a higher risk than something maybe that's internal um, that you still want to test, right? But uh, maybe you don't need, you know, 10 security tests run against it. Maybe you just run a rudimentary, you know, two or three. Um, so I think that uh, that's pretty much what causes us to differ is the type of technology um, and then maybe the severity or the, the risk of the application itself will determine kind of which test we run. Okay, looks like there's another question here. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, a while back you touched on the idea of uh, security champions, you know, people who are kind of embedded in these teams and who can, you know, represent for security because you can't be there all the time and certainly we, uh, we deal with the same thing um, at our organization. I was wondering, um, what techniques, uh, you know, what strategies do you take to grow these people, to, to give them, I mean, it's not just instinct, I mean, there's a little bit that you have to convey to them in terms of uh, uh, what they should watch out for and whatnot. And sometimes you find these people, they just fall into your lap on one team, and then another team may have nobody who's a standout that wants to, you know, say the unpopular thing when it needs to be said. <laughs> Yeah, there's a couple of things uh, I would say, and I, I'm not going to tell you that I have the perfect answer. It's still kind of a work in process, but I'll tell you what we found. Um, one is that 
uh, we have trained some people and given some actual, you know, like SANS intense training, but that's really not scalable when you consider that's about $5,000 per person, right? So the other thing that we've done, we, we have done, um, I don't know if you want to call them, I guess they're kind of like workshops where we've actually went um, on site to some places and we've developed um, some rudimentary training uh, that basically covers, it talks about uh, what they should look for from an open source compliance perspective, from a, from a application security vulnerability. You know, we've, we've said here are the top five application security things that we see at Nielsen and we talk to them about how to code around it um, and things like that. And then we actually take time to talk about their specific application. They may say, well, on ours, we, we really have this problem with we don't know anything about Apache and we're expected to. And from that, we can kind of delve in a little bit um, deeper. And the third thing that we've really done um, is, is we've gotten management downs approval. So we would meet with a technology officer and he, would, and he says security is the most important thing to me, right? And his managers then say, security is the most important thing to me. And that's what we've done, and we've gotten a lot of, of buy-in, um, is, is by starting at the top down, you make it a priority to all those so that we can talk to, um, our group is called product leadership, but I think everybody has something similar where it's the people that are the business side that may sometimes forget that they wanna make security a priority. So uh, we, we make sure that, that we have that representation to. Um, from the top down um, of management. So I don't know if that's a great answer, but that's what we're doing. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me, I, excuse me, I'll just, let me ask one question. I'll come back to you if we have a minute, but just one quick question. I have to ask you guys to grow up here. What does what uh, rugged DevOps, DevSecOps, what does it look like in five years? That's kind of a fun, it's kind of a fun question to think about. Um, and so I see, so I see a shared responsibility model. We've been talking about that for so long, right? Security is everybody's responsibility, but truly it's never truly sinks in, right? I feel it's happening in DevOps. I feel it's becoming uh, that, 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 that piece where developers are really understanding now what security folks do and why it's important. At the same time, security folks are understanding why development teams uh, don't, weren't getting it before. Or, it, they were speaking different languages. Um, I feel that uh, DevOps teams are going to be the source of new talent for security. I feel like the industry has uh, lost its way for a while towards audit compliance, and I think we're coming back to uh, where we began in a strong sense, in a strong uh, position in engineering, um, which which is good. Uh, I feel that. Um, uh, do you have, we, uh, we'll find ways to manage the tool sprawl. The tools, um, uh, I, I think we'll see some more standardized frameworks around managing the data outputs themselves than the tools to create that flexible model. Um, but those are some right. things. So. Yeah, I've just got a couple. I, I think that um, DevOps in five years, I think we'll, um, I think we'll be seeing more open source. I think that we've seen that over the past couple of years. We've seen better um, security tools um, that are open source and free to use. And we've even seen kind of that mixed model where um, we have companies that provide an open source tool that everybody can use. And then they also have that premium side, right, where if you want a little bit more support, or you want a little bit more features, um, here's what you can do. And then maybe, um, I think the other thing maybe that I see, I could be wrong, but, um, you know, DevOps is, is kind of the integration of development and, and operations, right? So I think that kind of like what we were saying, where we're pushing, we're having a security champion, I think that we're really going to see that trend maybe go back to where um, not only are they responsible for development and operations, but they're also responsible for security. And I think that we'll find better ways to train those people just like we are on the operational side. Okay, so. great. Well, we'll be continuing the conversation. You see it on the slide. I know there's a few more questions. We'll be on the side. You can ask us. We can ask us after. Thank you so much. Thank you.